Hello guys, uh, this is going to be our last uh, video of the semester and uh, in the last video I mentioned uh, geometric series uh, how we could use that form on fractions to write Taylor polynomials infinite polynomials so that was one type of shortcut that we covered in the last uh, previous section so in this uh, final lesson final video I'd like to discuss two more options uh, derivatives and antiderivatives uh, as tools and as shortcuts for finding Taylor polynomial so I don't know about you but in section 9.1 it was it was tough trying to construct these Taylor polynomial from scratch by doing all these various derivatives which can get pretty tedious at times depending on the uh, complexity of the function itself so we're gonna we're gonna find out in this section um, derivatives are not too bad antiderivatives are not too bad because we're applying that on polynomials which is a sum or a difference of many terms so we're basically we're essentially using the power rule uh, for the derivative and the antiderivative to get a new function out of it so we're gonna start by proving that the derivative of e to the x is in fact e to the x we know this to be true but we're gonna do this with a power series so since we've already proved before in Taylor uh, polynomial section that this is the power expansion the polynomial expansion for e to the x we did this from scratch by the way alright so we're gonna prove that the derivative of that is in fact the same thing which is kind of unusual because usually when you take a uh, a polynomial and differentiate it you get something completely different so this is going to be because it's an infinite series this is actually going to be true for e to the x so let's begin uh, on the right side in green here I'm showing you the derivative right the derivative of 1 is a constant is 0 and the derivative of x is 1 and so on and so forth so here I'm just using the power rule I'm moving the 2 to the front there it is and then subtracting 1 from the power so those denominators are all constants so nothing really happens to them but I could reduce those constants eventually and I'll get something a little bit cleaner which looks like this and that's in fact uh, what e to the x is so it's really not very complex to prove that the derivative of this polynomial is in fact the same polynomial so this must be e to the x in disguise okay so now oh, next I'd like to do the same but for sine x and cosine x uh, as you all know the derivative of sine x is cosine x now we're gonna prove this to be true using Taylor polynomial so I've um, written up what the infinite power series for sine x looks like and for cosine x as well so since I'm differentiating sine x so this is the polynomial for sine x if you do a term by term differentiation you get that after you simplify ta -da, you get the power series for cosine x again not very difficult to prove something interesting about sine and cosine you know sine has odd powers if you and then cosine has even powers these are attributes that these Taylor polynomials have inherited from sine and cosine if you remember back in trigonometry sine is considered to be an odd function because of the way you graph it is a reflection about the origin and cosine is an even function because if you graph cosine it's a reflection about the y-axis there is a reflection about the y-axis so those attributes are inherited in here uh, in the infinite polynomial which is kinda cool so this is what sine x looks like in disguise as a polynomial and this is what cosine x looks like as a polynomial 
All right, so we're going to try LNX, uh, the Taylor expansion for LNX is given as such and we showed this to be true in section 9.1 we did the expansion for uh, LN LNX it was around C equals 1 because we could not do it around C equals 0 since the natural log of 0 doesn't exist so that was the reasoning so we did this uh, in the notes so you can go back and kind of refresh your memory on that that's what it, it looked like now uh, what we're going to do here is, since we know the derivative of ln x is 1 over x, this is a true statement. So if I wanted to find a power series for 1 over x, but I know the power series for ln x, I could simply differentiate each one of these terms, simplify it, and the new power series that I get will represent 1 over x. Pretty straightforward, I hope. All right, and also uh, the number one, the first homework assignment in section 9.1, if you go back and, and look at your homework, you actually proved that 1 over x using Taylor expansion uh, around c equals 1 was in fact, this was your answer when you did uh, Taylor polynomial expansion. So here we are proving that this is in fact the same answer, but using a different method. I really like the next example. It's an arc tangent of x. And here's a true statement. The derivative of arc tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. So if I wanted to find an expansion, a polynomial, a power series for this fraction, I could simply differentiate the power series for arc tangent. And that is given by this polynomial you see in here. All right, so if I told you that's the polynomial for arc tangent, uh, differentiated, this is what you're going to get. And then in simplified uh, version, this is what you end up with. Now, how do we know if this makes sense? Well, what I really like about this example is that I can prove this to be true some other way. Remember that this is a fraction. In the previous section, the geometric form, we learned how to rewrite 1 over 1 plus x squared as a double negative where we can identify the value for a and we could identif identify r, right? You guys remember that? You had to do it on your homework. And then I can put that a and that r in my power series for geometric raised to the power of k. And in the last section, I believe I did an example similar to this. Not exactly the same, but similar. Uh, we had to separate the negative one uh, from the x. You don't have to, but I separated it so it was easier to plug in my values for k. And I could determine that this part right here is the part that makes the sign alternate. And then this one is the one that gives me all the powers of x, so the even powers of x. Right? So this is 2k, so I get 0, 2, 4, 6, and so on and so forth. So in doing that, using the geometric form, this is the answer we end up with, right? Look at all these powers, they're even. It's positive, negative, positive, negative. If I scroll up, that's exactly what we have, right? Positive, negative, positive, negative. All the powers are even, and it starts with a one. It's exactly the same. So we proved how to find an infinite series for this particular fraction two different ways using derivative of arc tangent and also using the geometric form so it's pretty good practice there all right so this wraps it up for derivatives now i'd like to dive in and discuss a little bit about antiderivative of power series what makes antiderivative a little bit different from derivative is that when you integrate a function, especially if it's an improper integral, you always end up with a constant of integration, which I'm going to call it k. I do not want to call it c because I will be using c later on as the center of the polynomial. So let's use k for the constant of integration. We know 
this integral e to the x equal e to the x plus k to be true. So we're going to prove it. Now, what I've done here, I've inserted the infinite series for e to the x, and I simply integrated term by term. So the integral of x, uh, of 1, is x. The integral of x, you have to add 1 to the power, so it becomes x squared, divide by the new power. Same thing with x squared, becomes x cubed, divide by the new power, and this was the older coefficient. So all these coefficients there are going to stay there, but we're going to also gain new coefficients in the denominator because of the rule, the power rule for antiderivative. And then here's my constant of integration at the end. So my job is to show that this expression, which I'm simplifying down here, is in fact representing e to the x. Right now, the way it looks, it doesn't look like e to the x. Most of it, most of it, you know, looks like e to the x. I'm missing a one, right? Because e to the x has a one at the beginning. This one starts with x. So I suspect that that k, that constant of integration, has to be one. How do we show it's one? So that's what I need to discuss right next. In general, when you integrate a power series and you want to identify the constant of integration k, you will need to plug in into the um, infinite series on both the right side and the left side. What's on the left side here? Well, the left side here is supposed to be e to the x which was the answer that I'm looking for, right? e to the x plus k, right? So here it is. So e to the x is equal to this, but this doesn't quite look like e to the x yet. Now, well, how do we know what the center of the polynomial is, right? Well, remember in uh, 9.1 when we talked about Taylor, right? This was the form. It was x minus c in parentheses to the power of n. Of course, it had some coefficients, but I'm only concentrating right now on the uh, part that surrounds x, right? So because all of these are just x to some power, so to get x to some power, that means c would have to be 0, right? So that's how I know the center of this polynomial on the right side here is 0. So therefore, I plug in 0 for x on the left side, and I also plug in 0 for x on the right side, and this should help me identify the constant of integration k. All right? So yeah, remember, I'm, the reason I'm plugging in 0 is because 0 happens to be the center of this polynomial. If the center of this polynomial is 5, then I will be plugging in 5 on the left and 5 on the right, depending on the problem. So since e to the 0 power gives us 1, and everything on the right is going to be 0 if you replace x with 0, obviously, the only thing that we don't know is k, so k will equal 1 eventually. So that's how you find the value for k. So once you replace k with that value 1, you've basically proved that this polynomial is e to the x. And it is. It looks exactly like the one for uh, the the the, uh, the Taylor polynomial for e to the x. Pretty cool, isn't it? So e to the x, the integral of that is e to the x, where k is one. Now, I also want to prove that the integral of cosine x is sine x. Plus, there's an integration again, a constant of integration. We know this to be the uh, power series for cosine x, because they're all even. Right? So if I integrate term by term again and simplify, that's the answer we get down here. And this is supposed to represent sine x. So I'm going to write sine x on the left, and then on the right side my new uh, polynomial that I obtained from doing the antiderivative of cosine x. Now, again, this particular polynomial seems like has a center c equals 0. So if I replace x with 0 on the left and all those x's on the right with 0, we'll get k is equal to the sine of 0. But the sine of 0 is 0, so therefore the value of k is 0. So I could just ignore k in this case, and then sine x will equal simply 
everything that you see from the x all the way to you know these odd powers and that's in fact what uh, sine x looks like right it starts with x where is it must have passed it there uh, I thought I wrote it at the top somewhere and I'm looking for it and I can't find it anymore. My goodness. I think I probably wrote it way, way at the top there. I know I did. I know I did. I'm not losing it. I promise. There it is. Okay. So sine X starts with X and then it goes, it alternates and then all the powers are odd. So that's essentially uh, what we proved. With example numero dos it starts with x and it alternates and all the powers are odd there you go all right very good so my next example is proving uh not proving but uh identifying what the power series for ln x plus one would be without having to use taylor expansion now, since I know there's a connection between ln x plus 1 and 1 over x plus 1 via integration, right? If I integrate 1 over x plus 1, I get ln of x plus 1 plus k. So I could find a Taylor polynomial for ln x plus 1 if I knew a Taylor polynomial for 1 over x plus 1 that I could integrate. Now, because what's inside here is a fraction, that makes my life a little bit easier. Your life, too. So I'm just going to use a technique learned in the previous section. So that since I can rewrite this as that, and I can go from here to there, since a is 1 and r is negative x, I can plug it into the geometric form, split up the negative 1 from... So notice when I split up the negative one in the x, the negative one has to be raised to the power of k. And also x has to be raised to the power of k, right? And then if you expand that, right, that's what the power series for 1 over x plus 1 looks like, in essence. All right? So now that I know that the power series for 1 over x plus 1 looks like this, I can integrate these terms. Right, and once I integrate those, <clears throat> I get this new polynomial here with a k at the end. So all of that is supposed to represent ln of 1 plus x. But I need to know what k is. So if k is a constant that is not 0, I need to make sure I add it to my infinite series. So I look at the center of the polynomial, and they're all x's. So therefore, the center is 0 again. So once you replace x with 0 on the left, we get the natural log of 1, which is 0. And on the right, everything is 0 except for k. And that will always happen, by the way. So that everything on the right is 0, because you're replacing x by the center with the value c. So k will end up being 0, so in this case, I could just ignore this k. So everything I see from the beginning to the dot, dot, dot is what I just simply copy down here. And so this represents the infinite series for ln of 1 plus x. Ta-da! So all of these equalities that you see here that I've been writing for every example, right? Remember this equality holds provided that we choose a value of x that is within the interval of convergence right i kind of mentioned that when we did the that lesson on interval of convergence right it's important that the value of x is coming from that interval because that guarantees convergence so if you're picking something outside of the interval of convergence this doesn't work anymore this doesn't mean anything okay so all of these are true provided the interval of convergence x is trapped between 
some value A and some other value B. So I didn't want to spend too much time putting down the interval of convergence because the main focus of this lesson was to talk about the derivative and the antiderivative. So I just want to clarify that. Okay, so our very last example is um, to also illustrate or explain why um, power series are so vital, so important in mathematics. Let's say I'm graphing the function e to the negative x squared uh, just in the first quadrant, and this is what the graph looks like. And I want to calculate the area under the curve. So that area would be uh, translated as the integral from 0 to 1 of the function dx. But this function is impossible, yes that's right, impossible to integrate. And there are so many functions out there that are impossible to integrate. Right? The ones we've discussed in class are only the ones, the well-behaved ones, the ones that we can actually use a technique and then get around it. All right. So, but there's a much larger sample out there that cannot be done with those techniques that we've learned in class. And you would need a computer generated system to actually determine this integral. And how do you think they program that in the computer? Well, infinite series has something to do with it, believe it or not. So, if we could find a power series basically for e to the negative x squared then it would be easy or simpler to figure out the antiderivative of each one of these terms and then plug in our limits and then we would find an approximation. And of course if we wanted to get a better answer we would make sure we add enough terms at the end or at the tail of that polynomial to get a certain uh, number of accuracy. So the question is how do we find uh, the power series for either negative x squared without having to use Taylor polynomial and all these derivatives that could be painful. All right, are you ready for this? It's going to be exciting. So since we know the power series for e to the x is given as such, remember when you have a substitution, like if you want to figure out e squared, f of 2, I'll plug in 2 here, and I'll plug in 2 there, and I'll plug in 2 here, and 2 here, and 2 here, and 2 here, and I would figure out what, you know, uh, e squared equals 2. All right? Let's call a substitution within a function. If I want to know what f of c is, I just replace x with c. So everywhere I see x on the right side, I just replace it with c. But what I'm interested in is how to find e to the negative x squared. So if I replace x with negative x squared, so I'm simply making a substitution, so if I'm replacing this c right here with negative x squared, then I would have to replace this c at the top here with negative x squared. And all of those c's you see on the right side with negative x squared. And that's essentially what I'm doing down here. So if you know e to the x, the figuring out e to the negative x squared isn't actually that bad it's just a simple substitution after we evaluate all these powers we end up with an alternating series a bunch of pluses and minuses and all these powers are going to be even because of those you know uh, when you multiply the exponents 2 times 2 and then let's say uh, two, 3 times 2 is 6 and then 4 times 2 is 8 right these are all going to be in some of those the even exponents are going to change the negative to a positive the odd exponent on the outside are going to keep that negative in there, right? So it's alternating. So now that we know what the infinite series for e to the negative x squared looks like, we can now integrate term by term. And that's what I'm doing here. And then I only did that up to five terms. And then I'm going to plug in my upper limit and my lower limit. And then I get this answer of 0.747. Then I went to Desmos, and then I actually plugged in that integral in Desmos, and then Desmos gave me 0.74682. So it's only accurate to two decimal places, but that's okay. We know if we add more terms at the end of this polynomial, and we're going to know the pattern already, right? If I want to add 10 more terms at the end, 
the pattern is pretty easy. I'll just, you know, it's just more work to do by hand, but this answer will eventually converge to the actual answer. Because remember, as you go to infinity, you get an accurate answer. Wow, we are done. So, um, I will not be assigning any homework for this section. I just want this video actually to be informational. Yes, it's part of the course, but uh, I'm going to take a load off by not putting this on the next exam and not putting this on the final exam. But for those of you moving forward to differential equations, you need to have a little bit of this background um, to understand what's coming ahead. So, you know, uh, if we had more time, uh, we would spend, uh, we would, I would develop more video to show some even more cool stuff, but I'd prefer next week that we spend some time um, reviewing for the final exam, which is coming up in two weeks. And um, you guys are gonna be busy this weekend studying for our exam coming up next week. All right, so um, no homework for this. You will not be tested on this. This is just, again, like I said, informational. And um, that's it. We're all done. If you have any uh, questions, please uh, email me. All right. Be good. Be safe out there. Take care. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.